Well, it is great to be with you uh, this morning, and to those joining online, I just want to say welcome. We're very grateful that uh, you, are, you are with us. And uh, we're going to be starting a new series titled Better. So turn to your, in your Bibles um, to Acts chapter 1. And uh, some, some things in life are just better. How many understand what I'm talking about? Like one scoop of ice cream is good, but two scoops is? Yeah. Right. Uh, raising canes is good, but Chick-fil-A is? Yeah. Hearing Pastor Zach preach in the chapel right now is good, but hearing me preach in the sanctuary is? Come on. Yeah. Oh, that's, I knew it. I knew it. There are many things in life that are good, but I don't want to just settle for good. I, I want uh, what's better. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16, we'll get to Acts, but in John chapter 16, he says, but I'm telling you the truth. It's better for you that I go away because if I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, I will send him to you. Some versions say it's beneficial or it's good or it's best or it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, if you were one of Jesus' disciples, I can imagine thinking, how is this better? I am walking with the Messiah. You are supposed to deliver us. I've seen you heal. I've seen you restore. I've seen you do miracle after miracle. How is it better that you go? And we don't always understand the why or the how or what makes something better. There's times where I would tell my kids, my children, ages eight, six, and four, to do something a different way because I know that the way they're doing it is okay, but it's not the best, it's not better. And so they have to trust me that the way that I am going to lead them in is better. I remember the longest time Sam, while mountain biking, uh, I, I would tell him, stand up on your pedals when you're going over rocks and roots because it will absorb the, the bumps and stuff. Don't stay on your seat, you're gonna get bucked. And he didn't understand that that was better until he experienced it, until he tried it out, until he, he believed and he trusted his dad to say, it feels a little odd to stand up. It feels a little intimidating, but it is better. There was and is an element of trust that is needed to step into the better. And in the same way, you might not understand everything there is to know about the Holy Spirit. Please don't let what you don't understand keep you from trusting what we do understand about God our Father. As we look to God our Father in heaven and we read his word that has been tried and true and it's been tested and it's found uh, infallible, it is authoritative. As we've seen him work in our lives, we can look back to the history of what he's done for us and our families. There's this element of trust that begins to well up in us that says, God, I believe that if you say this is better, it is better. How many would just say this morning, I, I want what's best for my life. I, I want what's better. Can I, can I just encourage you, church, as we look to Acts chapter one, as we look to Acts chapter two in the coming weeks, there, there have been many sermons that have uh, misrepresented who Holy Spirit is. Many people have had negative experiences with, with people pushing on foreheads or you look and you say, well, I don't wanna be that loud person. I, I, don't, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. But can I just encourage us to not uh, be intimidated um, by what we don't fully understand, but to look at our Father and trust his heart that his word is true. And it's my heart and it's my desire that I just remain open to all that God has for me. I don't want just an aspect of who God is. I don't want just a portion of who God is. My heart's posture, my heart's cry is that says, that says, God, whatever you want to do in my life personally, in my marriage, in ministry, in relationships, in friendships, God, whatever you want to do, I want to be open to what you have for me. And I trust you that if Jesus, you say it's better that you're gone, 
If you say it's better that you've sent your Holy Spirit, then I trust you in that. Can we just all say this uh, and repeat this after me? Say, Lord, I am open to all that you have for me. Help, help me, just, just follow along with me. Help me to trust you more. I want to experience new things. Take me to deeper waters. I'm open to more of your spirit. And I'm open to your gifts. I love you, Lord. Would you fill me today? That is my prayer today for our church. It's my prayer personally, and it's my prayer for you. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be able to share, look at the scriptures. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And this is... Luke that is writing this. He says this, in my former book, Theopolis, now Theopolis is a person, it's not the former book. This is a, a person of honorary uh, seating, you know, as he's, he's writing to the Romans. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but, but what? For the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Heavenly Father, I just stand here and ask that you would speak through me today. I, I uh, am so thankful this week in word and study. There's just so much that is inside me, and we just have a little bit of time. And so I just pray that you would remove what needs to be removed, that you would bring to forth what needs for this service, for the people watching online, for the people here in the physical building, God. And uh, this morning, we just we say we're open. And uh, I just ask that you would speak in kindness and gentleness and that your spirit would just soften our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the, this book records all of the acts of the apostles of the early church as it was being established. It is the book where we develop a greater understanding of the role of the person of Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I want everyone to hear me. And I want everybody to hear this very clearly so there's no misunderstanding. When you repent and when you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life and you turn your ways of thinking to God's ways of thinking, you say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. It is at that moment that the Spirit of God is placed inside you. You have the Spirit of God if you are saved and you are redeemed. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God is within you. And as your heart's posture says, I am open to whatever you want to do, there is a baptism of the Spirit that is available. And as we open our hearts to the continual work of the Holy Spirit of God, as he convicts us of our sin, as he leads us into all truth, as he leads us to repentance, as he guides us, there is an immersion or there is a baptism of the Spirit where there is more and more of God's Spirit that just begins to well up in our hearts and in our minds and it begins to overflow. Now, the book of Acts was written by who? Luke, right? Dr. Luke. He's a very detailed individual, and it is the sequel to his gospel, the gospel of Luke. It is important to recognize that the book of Acts is the continuation of the story of Jesus Christ. 
The Gospels record his life and his ministry and his works while here on earth, but the book of Acts records his ministry and his miraculous signs while he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. It is a continuation. The Gospel of Luke is the beginning of the works of Jesus Christ, while the book of Acts is the continuation of the works of Jesus Christ. Now, the miraculous events and the, the ministry that is recorded in the book of Acts are not to glorify Peter, Paul, and Mary or any of the other disciples. Um, they are to glorify Christ as he continues to save and heal and deliver people through his bride, the church. And he does this by giving us a promised gift. And I want to answer a few questions about this promised gift. And I hope that you would take notes, that you'll be open to this. Um, but the first question I want to answer is what is this promised gift. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem and do not leave until you receive the gift that my father has promised. Wait for the gift. The simple answer to that question is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse four says, wait for the gift. And verse five, it tells us what the gift is. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, first off, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And being baptized in the Holy Spirit is not like Star Wars, where you receive this special force. You don't become a Jedi and you have this force. It's not this ambiguous emotion that wells up inside you. It, it is not this just one-time experience. The gift is being fully immersed in a person, and Jesus promised that the Father will send us this gift to help us. Scripture describes Holy Spirit, the person of Holy Spirit as his roles as being our advocate, our helper, our guide. He reminds us, he convicts us, he empowers us, he leads us into all truth, he intercedes for us. When we do not know what to pray or where to go or what to do, he comforts us. This is who Holy Spirit is. That sounds like a person that I want to be open to, a person that I want to be closely connected with, to be guided, to be uh, convicted of, to, uh, of, and to be led into repentance. I want to be close with him. Now again, if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside you. But as we remain sensitive and open to whatever the Holy Spirit is leading us to, there's an experience where we become fully immersed and saturated with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at what that exactly looks like. And, um, I, I, but, and what this experience looks like, the baptism of the Spirit looks like. But I, I want to tell you this, that the Holy Spirit is not weird, okay? People are weird. In fact, one in three people are weird. So look to your left, look to your right. If they're not weird, you're the weird one, okay? We see people express themselves in all sorts of ways that we say, I would never do that. And let me just encourage you, God is not going to just come inside you and turn you into someone that you just, God works through you and your personalities, is what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is not weird, people are weird. Be open to the Holy Spirit. As Luke explains how the ministry of Jesus is going to continue, now that he has left earth, uh, we see that it's not going to be by might. We see that it's not going to be by working hard. It's not going to be by power or strength. It's by God's spirit that, we, that will come alongside of us and help us continue the work of Jesus. May we as a church, may we as a people be full of the spirit of God so that we can continue the work and ministry of Jesus Christ and continue to further his kingdom here on earth. Let's partner with the Holy Spirit as we labor for Christ. Days before Jesus was crucified, in John chapter 14, he's talking with his disciples and he says, in a little bit, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and you'll know the way through the Father. And he says this in verse 12, he says, very truly, and he's talking to his disciples, just days before the crucifixion, 
He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name. So who is the one that is still doing the works? Whose ministry is it? Jesus, because he is doing it. And why? So I will, I will do whatever you ask in my name. Why? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, we're not asking for lottery tickets. We're not asking for, uh, you know, different things. The purpose of asking the Father for good gifts is to glorify the Father. Verse 16, he says, uh, or verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor it knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. This is salvation. The Spirit of God living in you, and he is with you. That's salvation. And jump down to verse 25. He continues, all of this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus' words point us to our next question, which is what is the purpose of of this gift. What is the purpose of this gift? The purpose of this gift is that the Father may be glorified. How is he glorified? Through our witness and our testimony of who he is and what he's done. That is how God the Father is glorified here on earth. It's through your testimony. It is through your witness. Looking at our main text today in verse 8, Jesus said, but you will receive what? power to, or when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be, you will what? Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Make no make mistake about it. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can do something. It's so that we can be something. The purpose of the whole baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can go out and do witnessing. It's so that we can become a witness. There is a difference between doing and being. What does it look like to be a witness? It involves receiving power in many different areas, but I just want to highlight four this morning. The first power that we receive in being baptized with the Spirit is a moral power. A moral power. When we are filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, we find a new power to overcome temptation. This baptism by fire changes your heart and burns within you a holy conviction. It changes the way that, that you feel about sin. It changes your appetite where you no longer want to be satisfied for the temporal things of this earth. It gives you a desire to say, God, I want to live for you. I want to be a holy sanctuary. I want to be someone that is far from sin and close to you. It gives you a moral power. I've seen, and I'm sure you have too, many people lose their witness because their actions don't align with their beliefs. How many understand what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit is your only hope to live out what you believe. It gives us the fruit of the Spirit. It gives us, and he leads us into truth. He reminds us of all of God's teachings. It, 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 as temptation comes our way, he, he brings forth and he quickens the word of God through this moral power, this, this quickening of the spirit that brings the word to life where we can overcome temptation. The second area is uh, not just changing our heart and how we feel about things, but he changes our thoughts. He gives us a mental power. Did you know that when you are judged in heaven, that you will not just be judged on what you do and what you don't do? that there will actually be a judgment of your thoughts. The Spirit gives us victory over our thoughts and our hearts. May we never grow content in just saying, well, I didn't sleep with that woman. Well, I didn't punch my neighbor. 
well, I didn't steal that thing, may we get to the point where the Holy Spirit of God begins to change our thoughts, where we're not even being tempted in those areas. Would, would we be open for the Spirit of God to continue the work of sanctification. It's justification being made just as if we had never sinned that happens instantaneously when we say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. There is salvation. But then we just want to be glorified. We just want to be saved, and then we just want to jump over here to heaven and say, God, would you glorify me where we're removed from the very presence of sin. But there is this process of sanctification that is a part of the works of salvation. And that is the spirit of God inside of us that reminds us of the word of God. That changes the way that we think and the the way that we feel. This baptism of the Holy Spirit changes our desires. It changes our thoughts. And it gives us victory over our thoughts. Did you come this morning with anxious thoughts? Did you come this morning with impure thoughts, with unrest or turmoil or depression? The baptism of the Spirit of God can give you power over your mental struggles, which then testifies of his power to save. I believe that. The third uh, type of power that we receive is miraculous power. This is demonstrated by signs and wonders, healings and miracles. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have personally witnessed or experienced a a miraculous healing from God? Raise them high so people can look around. This is our God. And this is not the work of pastor who prayed for you or husband or wife that prayed for you or friend or Sunday school teacher. This is the work of who? Jesus Christ. It is the continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ as he sits on the right hand of the throne of God and as he hears and he intercedes on our behalf. How many would say, I want to see more miraculous things happen? Why? Not so that you can live a pain-free life. God doesn't want to heal you of your cancer just to make you have an extra five or 10 or 20 years. He wants it so that people will recognize that he has the authority to forgive sins. Eternity is a long time. Eternity is a long time. I want to see things. You know what's weird is, is just when you hear of someone being sick, When you hear of someone having ailments, when you see a need or a miracle just saying, well, I wish you well, why don't we just go before God and say, God, I believe that you can do this. I believe the stories that I read, I've seen you move in my life. I've seen, maybe I haven't seen it, but I've seen it in someone else's life. And I'm gonna believe you and I'm gonna trust you that you're gonna provide in a miraculous way. Let's put the Lord uh, and take him at his word. Let's believe for greater things. There's a miraculous power. God, would you just fill us this morning? The fourth kind, and this isn't, this isn't an exhaustive list. I could preach here four sermons, but it's a spiritual power. A spiritual power. We have been given the authority in Jesus' name to cast out demons and push back the force of Satan and reclaim the spiritual territory that has been taken from us. When, when we don't know what to pray, we are given a spiritual language to pray in. And we'll learn about that in the coming weeks. But part of being a witness is having spiritual power and authority over the enemy. That, that is what we receive to be a witness. It, it is the same power of God that lives where? In us. In you, the same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, deader than a doornail. I don't know how you can read about crucifixion in the history of Roman history, right? right the, whole, the history of Roman history, that was well thought out. Um, I don't know how you can read about that and not believe that he was dead. And that same power that raised Jesus to life is in us. May it be awakened May the spark of belief be fanned into a flame. May we operate in spiritual power. Elizabeth and I are watching uh, The Chosen. How many have seen The Chosen? Okay, a lot. Where it takes the life and ministry of Jesus and it dramatizes uh, scripture and then it kind of adds in these side stories of characters that doesn't 
really, uh, you know, expound much about their backgrounds. And it takes some liberties, but it tries to stay close to scriptures. I'm still undecided uh, on, on where I'm at with it. Uh, and, uh, but that's not the point. Um, I, I don't, I'm not seeing anything heretical in it. Don't hear me. I'm, I'm not preaching against it. I just don't know if I enjoy it. Um, but in episode one, a Pharisee goes to this woman who is demon-possessed, and he tries to perform this exorcism, and this woman very creepily, and the demon speak through her and says, we're not afraid of you, to this Pharisee. We're not afraid of you. If you stood face to face with the demonic powers of this world, would you be afraid of them or would they be afraid of you because of the power of God that lives inside you? God, help us to live as you lived, to set the captives free. What would happen if we walked around our workplaces not just looking to clock out, not just looking at how we can avoid certain people, but if our eyes were open spiritually where we began to walk and we began to see deeper things. Uh, this isn't in my notes and, and this is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I believe that the West, America, is facing more bold demonic oppression and possession than we ever have in the history of our nature right now, today. And if we as the church cannot recognize that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against brother or sister. It's not against a political party. It's not against uh, our schools. It's not against, it is against the spiritual powers of Satan and the demonic. If we cannot recognize that and say, God, I'm open to however you want to use me. I'm going to take up my moral power. I'm going to take up the mental power. I'm going to take up this miraculous power and believe you for miraculous things. I'm going to take up the spiritual power and we are going to reclaim what has been taken from us in our families, in our neighborhoods, in this community, in this state, in this nation, around the world. That's why we do missions. We are reclaiming territory for the kingdom of God. We are continuing the work of Jesus Christ. We need to receive power to be a witness, not do witnessing. It's more than wisdom in what to say or the courage to say it. It's the spirit of God that baptizes us, that purifies us, that changes us the way we think and feel and see things so that we might look more like Christ for the glory of God. Ask yourself this question. Does your witness look the same as it did last year? God, may we be open and sensitive to the continual, ongoing, never-ending work of the Holy Spirit of God that continues to refine us. As Pastor Brett comes, we'll answer one final question, and that's just simply this, how do I receive it? How do I receive this gift? There's three things. Ask, wait, and steward. Jesus said in Luke 11, verses 9 through 13, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. I'll read that again. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I would encourage you to begin to ask God for this gift. And if you haven't received it yet, don't stop asking. 
I've known people and I don't understand why the Lord gives the gift at different times. There's people that receive it right at salvation. There's people that have prayed for it for 40 or 50 years and they receive it. I don't understand why that is. I'm not gonna try to explain it, but that shouldn't prevent us from continually asking. Elizabeth has recently gotten her substitute license to teach in the schools and she's been going into different classes and she was a PE teacher last week. <laughs> That's just ironic if you know Elizabeth. Um, but uh, last week on, on Thursday, she had an all day position in, in a classroom and Essie, my youngest, four years old, knew that she was gonna be spending time with daddy. And so from the very moment that she woke up on Thursday, she said, oh dad, we're gonna spend time together. You're gonna spoil me, you're gonna spoil me. Can we get donuts? Can we get donuts? And I kid you not, when I picked her up from preschool, at 11 o'clock, she asked me no less than 50 times to get donuts. No, no less. And I'm, if you've been around my daughter, you know that I'm telling you the truth. But she was absolutely insistent that we get donuts. And I said, I said to her, isn't just spending time with me special enough? She said, but daddy, eating donuts is spending time together. <laughs> she was persistent. And guess what? She never got her donut. Oh, don't shame me. Shame the devil. Come on. I didn't get her one. Grandpa would have gotten. In fact, I, I was doing a wedding in Iowa City on Friday, and I call my dad, and I hear bleep, 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 bleep in the background. I said, Dad, are you at Hy-Vee? And he goes, yeah, the kids wanted candy and ice cream. We come home, we've got two tubs of ice cream. Essie, uh, Saturday morning when we saw her, she's like, fun dip, fun dip, which is just sugar sticks, okay? Um, so gr grandpa would have given it to her, but I didn't. And she, she asked me over and over and over again, but I knew that's not what she needed that day. She, she needed to learn a lesson. She needed fruits and vegetables. She needed patience. She needed to understand that, that being with her dad is good even when there's not donuts involved. But how many know that there's a better? <laughs> she didn't stop asking. Which leads me to the second step is wait. Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until the father sends the gift. He didn't give a timeline. He did say a few days, but he didn't say 10 days or 40 years. We, we wait for a lot of things that are far less important than the Holy Spirit of God in this baptism. We go to a, a theme park and we wait in line for a roller coaster. I've seen wait lines at different amusement parks for four hours for a ride that lasts 90 seconds. We wait in line for sporting events. We wait in line at the state fair for pork chop on a stick or a Campbell's corn dog. People wait three days outside of new Chick-fil-A's to get free Chick-fil-A, 52 sandwiches in a year. How long, answer this in your heart, how long would you be willing to wait if you knew at the end of the wait you are guaranteed to receive this gift of the promise. You say, I'm just willing to wait two hours. I'm willing to wait a day. I'm willing to wait two weeks. I'm willing to wait 40 years, 44 years, 50 years. I, I want you to hear my heart while I say this, but I'm afraid that church has become like a fast food experience. We're in and we're out, we're, we're in just long enough to get fed, but we're unwilling to really wait to relax and enjoy the company. When was the last time that you truly waited upon the Lord? He said, God, I'm just not gonna move. I'm just gonna sit here and I'm just gonna wait until I feel like I'm released. 
When was that last time for you? And I don't ask that to, to, to put on you this ambiguous, just like you just gotta sit and kumbaya and just like forever. Like th- there's a, a part that we'll get to of stewarding, but scripture is clear. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their, are you feeling tired this morning? You feeling burned out as a parent? You feeling exhausted as a business owner? The last thing is to steward what God has given you. In your time of prayer, the Lord puts something on your heart. Obey. In that moment, instantaneously, obey. Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with a little can be trusted with a lot. As the Holy Spirit brings things to your mind and your attention that you need to repent of, then repent. If he asks you to deal with unforgiveness or anything, then deal with the unforgiveness. If, if he reveals to you, I was reading in Matthew and through the Gospels this week, if he reveals that, that you've sinned against a brother or a brother sinned against you, go and, and reconcile and be reconciled and we respond, we steward everything that the Spirit is wanting to do in and through our lives. We're open to however he wants to move. I want you to hear this. Receiving the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit has more to do with the posture of your heart than what you do or what you say. But what you do and what you say are reflections of the posture of your heart. In seeking this gift, we must remain fully open to however the Holy Spirit moves and manifests in our life. And it all comes back to trust. As we look to our Heavenly Father and we say, God, would you give me a fish? He's not going to give us a snake because I trust in the character of who God is. Would you turn your eyes upon Jesus? Would you turn your eyes upon heaven? Would you be reminded of his faithfulness, knowing that he is wanting what's best for you? We're gonna close, and I'm gonna invite people in just a moment, I'll walk you through this, to come forward. And we're gonna close with this song, Make Room, where it says, here I lay every fear, I lay every doubt down at your feet, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to do. And I would ask that if you're not currently in a state of being able to sing that song truthfully, that you would just allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in your heart, to work in your mind, in, and uh, continue to bring uh, us closer. So would you stand and would you close your eyes with me with every head bowed and eye closed? Jesus was in this constant cycle of asking, waiting, and then stewarding. We see him spending time with God the Father, then waiting, and he wasn't in a hurry. In fact, he so much wasn't in a hurry that he was four days late to his one of his best friends, Lazarus' death. Four days late, because he just wasn't in a hurry. But he stewarded everything that the Father asked of him without hesitancy or reservation. So Jesus, right now, we just wait upon you. I pray, God, that we would look to your character, your track record. It would build in us just a confidence that you know what's best for our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. So with every eye closed and head bowed, if you here this morning, you say, I just need the moral power to be a witness because I'm stuck in a sin and I feel like I need victory morally, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray for you. Say, I need moral power. Yes, see that? If you say, I need mental power because my mind has just been a battlefield and I'm losing in many different ways, would you just raise your hand? Say, I'm just losing in that. I've got anxiety, I've got depression, I've got uh, just thoughts that are impure. I'm not acting upon those thoughts, but these are thoughts you say, I need mental power. 
How many would say that you want miraculous power and you're open to praying out loud for people at your work and your family, for your son and daughter and say, I'm okay with the spirit of God moving in a miraculous way. And you just say, I want that miraculous power. Would you raise your hand? Say, I'm open to that. How many would say this morning that I need the spiritual power? I'm open to all of God's gifts, including maybe a spiritual language that, that will help you pray when you don't have the words or the knowledge of how to pray that, that includes that power to push back the enemy and, and, and the ground that he's taking and say, I need that spiritual boldness, the same power of Jesus Christ that raised him from the dead in me and say, I need that spiritual power. Would you raise your hands? Jesus, I pray that you would give freely this morning. And I pray that as we seek, as we wait, as we're not in a rush, God, that this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow, God, may we not just plow through our God time with you, but every moment, every breath would be time with you. Let's give you priority because you are the one who are worthy. And I pray that this morning, that as you speak on people's hearts, God, before you give the gifts, before you do anything, God, that we would be obedient to what you're asking of us, that we would respond, that we would acknowledge our covenant between us and you, Lord. And so I just pray for every heart, every mind, that we would be open to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.